Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So we have a couple thank yous and introductions that we want to lay out here. First of all, uh, happy Valentine's Day. And uh, yes, we support love around here. So. Um, uh, we want to say the most loving thing that I can do is to tell you that I'm only going to speak for under 15 minutes and then turn it over to you. Hey, whoa, 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 you don't have to clap. OK, OK. Jeez, tough crowd. Uh, so first of all, I want to say thank you to our translators, which include two of our linguistic students today. So please give me a, a, a applause. OK, thank you for that. Uh, today is a, a nice special day for us because we invited our Board of Visitors uh, for the university. We don't always get a chance to integrate our Board of Visitors directly into something like a town hall meeting. And so uh, I wanted to take a, uh, some time for us to have them introduce themselves so you can know some of the people who are representative. Each, each of the seven sisters of the Humane System have uh, a Board of Visitors, and those are people who volunteer their time to really be our guides, our advocates our support system and our loopback system on feedback. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce, I think some of you as you were walking in got copies of their email so that you know how to be in touch with them and if there are things that concern you, they need to know about it or they you know, obviously can reach internally and now externally as well. So with that, I wanna introduce the chair this year of our, uh, our excuse me, of our, um, uh, our Board of Visitors. They are, uh, as I say, they are a group that meets with us every 60 days and they give us, you know, we offer them some, some usually some thorny problems or some d updates and then they help us kind of work through those. So with that, I want to introduce our chair, Luke Naya. Luke is uh, a Muskie graduate. He is the program director for uh, children's uh, behavioral health here at uh, DHHS and he's been a, uh, a, a public official for a long time. So please join me in welcoming Luke Naya, who will introduce the Board of Visitors. So please join me in welcoming Luke. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. As the president said, I'm Luke Naya. I'm a Children's Behavior Health Program Coordinator. I'm a Muskie alumnus, but I'm, I also have my bachelor's and Masters from USM, uh, bachelor's economics and uh, masters in public policy and management, and also masters in counseling. And I will just turn the microphone to each board member to introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Charlie Michelo. I'm chair of the board of visitors of the Muskie School, um, as well as a member of the board of visitors for USM. And the Muskie School is sort of unique, as you know. It's one of the few named schools in the university main system. And it, it includes undergraduate um, as well as graduate programs um, in tourism and hospitality and in uh, uh, geography and anthropology and public health administration management and in a master's in policy planning and management. Um, and so it's going both directions um, in the coming five years. Uh, it, it, the graduate programs are part of the consortium that includes the new uh, Center for Graduate and Professional Studies, uh, which uh, hopefully will be housed in a new building combining law, business, and public policy uh, courses. But in addition, um, it's extending downwards with a, a, a now an undergraduate major in public health management, um, and we hope to further the linkages with um, undergraduate departments in economics and in history and tie it into the uh, legacy of Senator Ed Muskie. Um, thank you very much. And Becky? Good morning, everyone. My name is Julia Trujillo Luengo. I uh, now currently work for the city of Portland and I run the Office of Economic Opportunity. But probably within the last 15 years or so, I've dedicated my life to diversity, inclusion, multiculturalism, immigrant integration. Um, and I am also a Husky graduate. I graduated in 2005 with an international studies bachelor's degree. I'm Becky Conrad. Um, I came to Maine as a, as a student, and I've never left, so I'm on that live-work Maine trajectory and have been working mostly in higher ed um, my career 
for Bates and Maine College of Art, but have um, been a huge supporter of our public system and am really pleased to be both on this Board of Visitors and the Muskie School Board of Visitors. Um, I live in Lewiston, Auburn, and I am one of your um, reps for that campus in that community, which I see as very integral to both um, our region and our state's future. Um, that, that's an area that we see great potential for USM to grow and expand and flourish and lead. So thank you very much. So I'm, I'm going to introduce, uh, have them introduce themselves quickly. Uh, here in front, we have uh, different uh, vice presidents, directors, et cetera, that can have, uh, that will be component parts of our presentation today. So I'm going to start with the head of our foundation, have them quickly introduce themselves. The reason this will be important is because I, I really will be talking, at least I've got a time to uh, well under 15 minutes. And then the whole idea is for you guys to an, you know, ask questions. Many of them will probably be drill down questions, so they may, you may be asking one of these. So as you listen to these folks and you have a question about finances, you'll know who to go. If you have some question about student uh, academic affairs, uh, you'll know who to go, or student life, you'll know who to go to. So I'm gonna start with our foundation. Yeah, good morning, my name is Ainsley Wallace. I'm the president and CEO of the USM Foundation, which uh, raises money for the university. Also, our alumni association is part of the foundation, and we also run our corporate partners program. Good morning, um, I'm Janine Musi, and I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. So I um, oversee all academics at USM, and I've been working closely this year um, with the Intercultural Diversity Advisory Council, which is advisory to the President and to many of us um, up here at the table. And I um, am also organizing the Common Read activities, events, and uh, intellectual conversation at the institution. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm David Roussel. I'm the Interim Vice President for Student Affairs. Uh, the team that I work with provides a lot of student services. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alec Porches. I serve as Chief Business Officer for the USA uh, that are outside of the classroom. And uh, I'm sure maybe there'll be some questions about that later. University, so focusing on all financial matters for us. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jean Paquette, and I'm the Vice President of Corporate and Workforce Engagement, and I oversee the Career and Employment Hub, Professional Development Programs, and the OLLI Program. Happy Valentine's Day. My name is Nancy Griffin, and I'm the Chief Operations Officer, and um, I'm really a Jill of all trade and do anything that the President needs done, but I also oversee facilities management and all of the capital project planning management projects for us. Good afternoon, everyone. Jared Cash, uh, Vice President for Enrollment Management and Marketing, and I work with a great team that spans quite, a, quite across the campus from admissions to registra to IR, I'm seeing you all here, but a great team that really athletics, is, see, now you're focused on vision, Nancy, um, but who works really closely together to create synergies around making sure that we recruit students who retain here, that's always how I look at it, and that we build the reputational strength of this university. So I've been here with you since July 1, and it's been a great six to seven months. So. And I'm Natalie Jones, I'm the Vice President of Human Resources, serving all three of the University of Southern Maine campuses. I've been here for about four and a half years, uh, and I'm hopeful that you all know what human resources is and what we cover, <laughs> and if you don't, see me after. <laughs> We're at 80% of all complaints go to Natalie, so, uh, so if you have that, Not true. Okay, right. Nine, 90s, what she's saying. Um, so uh, I get a chance to kind of give you a quick overview of where the university is. And uh, actually, it's great to start a presentation. Well, no, it's great to end a presentation on how far we've come. For those of you who were here with us six years ago, uh, we were in such dire straits that the Chronicle of Higher Ed and Inside Higher Education listed us as perhaps the example of financial disaster in higher education. It actually portended what has turned out to be 13 since that time, just here in New England, 13 organizations not merging, but going under completely. And we could have easily, uh, certainly we looked like we were about to become one of them. What I'm gonna show you today is not only how we didn't become one of them, but how we have become one of the more notable universities in New England and hopefully eventually beyond. And that that 
that comeback has been, especially given our demographics, has been truly an expression of how much these folks and you in the audience have helped bring us back. And I don't take a lot of credit for this because I think what, what I personally have been able to do is just to support what you have come to me and said, we need to get better at this, we need to do this right. And it's, it's here in the university. And it's not something that comes out of my brain, it's something that comes out of our collective brain. And it's been a hard journey, but it's actually the last four or five years really brought us to a whole new place. And so I can share some of that with you. So uh, the other thing I want to do today is talk about what does the next five years look like? And it's pretty exciting. It's not, you know, we've been struggling to, to kind of stabilize, get our operations going well, respecting students in a whole new way, focused on students' interests, being able to support students and faculty and staff. And you'll see some good numbers in all of those areas. And then, what, is the, what does that next five years actually look like? And the answer is we're building that story as we go along. So this town hall is kind of the beginning of that story. So let me just start off. First of all, uh, we did the welcome. And now I want to talk about the achievements of the last five years. And then if you look at, you know, when the, this is, uh, by the way, if you were in San Antonio, that first hallmark of 7.3% increase, headcount now moving from about 770 students to something in the order of just under 8,500 students, by the way. That puts us only 1,100 students behind the flagship, and I think you're going to see this growing. So what that means is we're likely to have about the same number of students that the flagship has, and that puts us in being where we're located. That's a powerful story for us to start telling and to develop and build on more than we should. And if we weren't in northern New, in northern New England, those numbers may not be that impressive over a four year. In northern New England, where we are losing 18 year olds at the point of negative 11% between now and 2026, and that's been a downward slide since 2011, that tells you quite a lot about what we've been able to do despite the demographic disadvantages of being in northern New England from an 18 year old perspective. The other thing is the budget, and I want to give lots of thanks to a lot of people, including this group, and. Our porch is certainly uh, coming on a year ago has really helped us have a careful balancing of our budget. There are people who say, well, we need to spend more on this and more on that. But you know what well, we know in this, this university, sadly, we know what bankruptcy looks like, and it's painful. <laughs> Just like in your household, sometimes there are things you want, but you know if you spend it, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're really not, not going to be able to grow, and you're going to be in a lot, of, a lot of danger. So the fact that we've been able to kind of stay in the black in our budget for next year, 2021, remains in the black, especially if the governor comes through with that 3%. So that's very good news for, for an organization that was $16 million in the hole in 2013-14. So very, very uh, pleased. And then donations. And this is one of the things that I would say, one, I think it's one of the best indicators of your health. Because you know people here, including myself, we get paid to increase enrollment. We get paid to uh, you know, increase to make sure that we stay in the black on the budget. Nobody gets paid to give us money. Uh, I've been tempted sometimes, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the fact that we raised last year a record $7.3 million to benefit USM students and scholarships and commitments to different buildings and different you know, our, our nursing simulation labs and things like that, those kind of cybersecurity and, and computer science, those million dollar gifts add up fast. And that is a great indication that there's faith in the university from other people outside the university. You and I, I hope, believe in the university. We're here for a reason. We know what we can contribute. But when third party people give us money, they're saying, I believe in you too. And that's a huge statement I, and that, that we can't ever um, uh, you know, be more grateful for that. And then finally, retention. And this is something that's haunted USM for a long time, right? In the 90s when I first started teaching here, uh, you know, uh, quite frankly, there was this just so many students, and we knew we were going to lose a lot of them. That's not acceptable. On a number of ways, that's not acceptable. I think morally, it's not acceptable. Because what happens is if you bring a student in, they can't pay for it, or they're not here for the right reasons, or whatever, and they go out. Now they have debt, but they don't have a degree. They're actually worse off when they leave us. And that's not right. And so you'll see some of the stuff that we've been doing around keeping them. What's the two most important things we're doing to keep students at 7% increase? And by the way, in American higher education, if you were to get a plus 7% increase, if you got a plus 2% increase, you'd have national press releases. So for us to get a 7% increase, and there are two major pieces. One is our advising has greatly strengthened. Incredible commitment on the part of the team of advisors, professional advisors that we have, and faculty advisors that have helped get students on the right path and have conversations and solve problems. 
my statement to our, our people, our staff and faculty is say yes. Say yes. Now, we can't necessarily do exactly sometimes what students want because sometimes it's, uh, it's, not, it's against the rules or whatever. But the, when I say say yes, it's find a way to solve the problem. Find a way to solve the problem. These students are coming to us, and they don't have a lot of money sometimes. They're trying to work too much uh, or work because they have to. And so our role is to try to make them successful. So advising and financial aid, because semester to semester, if you don't have to worry as much about paying your next semester bill, you'll come back and complete. And the research is really clear. If you wake up every morning and you consider yourself a student first, you're much more likely to complete. And that's, uh, that's been the key to our success. Many other things that are going on in the university, those, uh, those five, four or five indicators are all really good news. Any great university has got to have think, positive trends in this area, and we are. Uh, let's take a quick look at some of the, uh, the more exciting stuff in terms of physical development. I think many of you are aware that our present parking lot goes away. We'll talk about where the, and by the way, we have a plan. No, no <laughs> net loss in parking. If there's one thing that, except on the storm day, then there's another thing that comes across my, but the number one thing that comes across my email, of course, is uh, issues of parking, right? And so the good news is our plan, we have an extensive plan for parking at the end of this. Uh, and, and even during the construction phase, we don't have a net loss. Uh, so we keep the number of parking spots we have now. And by the time we finish, even accounting for the 750, uh, uh, 577 beds that we'll be putting into the new dormitory, uh, the residence hall here, will have additional parking that will have a net gain in parking. So if you're worried about parking, uh, or if you're not worried about parking, we'd prefer us not to drive as much, I'm with you on that too. But the city of Portland's gonna make us have those parking spots and we will have those parking spots. So if you take a look, there are a couple things that you can see right there. Very exciting. So where the parking lot is, we bring back green space, which will be much more attractive. You can see looking in from Bedford Street, you're going to have your new career center and student center. This is a place where our commuter students, remember most of our students, 70 plus percent of our students are commuters. They're coming here for the day. They don't have a lot of great places to hang out, right? They can kind of hang out in the library, but they don't really you know. Uh, Woodford, I mean, you know, Woodbury is not the best place in the world in terms of just feeling really comfortable. It's, it's okay. <laughs> but having a place where they can come in and be comfortable, obviously a big help, and then have the career center. One of the things we want to be known for, helping students get internships so that they can get into the job market and get their, their dreams going fast. So, and here you see on the right-hand side is the residence hall. That smaller or slightly lower section would be graduate students and law students, right? So we have a lot of them that would need uh, maybe even uh, young faculty housing. And then over on the other side, or, uh, the larger area will be upperclassmen, juniors and seniors for sure, but also perhaps sophomores, but we're trying to be very careful stabilizing the Gorham campus and moving forward with having an option to, to be here in Portland. And by the way, we did the market study so that 577 is without hurting the Gorham campus, right? So we know that just in probably within a mile of where you're sitting, maybe two miles within your sitting, we have hundreds of students, many of them paying a really high rental market fee. This will be below market, so all of those units will be a combination of studio, et cetera, uh, will be available to them below what they would pay if they were in an apartment on Dartmouth Street or an apartment even in South Portland. So it would be on campus, uh, in a place where you would have access directly to the dining hall in the student center. So, uh, just a couple other views of it. This is if you're looking across Wish Camper. By the way, just a little side note, you can see where those poles are. We're gonna try to make this as sustainable environmentally as possible. So the idea is that those cross-laminated timbers are something much better environmentally than steel, which has a huge carbon footprint, and it begins an industry, we hope, here in Maine, that will end up kind of kicking in and start using this. So we could actually hopefully contribute to the main economy. At the very least, at least we'll be making a, a stronger environmental positive impact. Um, another view, oh, let me go back one. So just another view of this is kind of looking up towards Masterton. So this is what students would see if they were coming out of the dormitory, uh, out of the residence hall. It's very attractive, a lot of glass, a lot of self-facing. Um, the idea, again, is to make it a place where you want to hang out. We're going to have the MPG uh, you know, uh, studios in there so that there'll be uh, live music in there. Or not live music, but uh, sort of live music. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, 
We might do that too, but anyway. And so, and there will all be, also the plan is to have a skywalk that goes from the residence hall over there so that, uh, you know, on a Saturday morning you can come down in your pajamas and go to, you know, get something and, and uh, it can be a relaxing, safe place and you also don't have to get your winter jackets on to get out there. Um, this is a, a kind of a looking back from sort of Masterton across the quad. This is what it might look like, the outside might look like. They were do actually doing, the architects were doing some work on designing this this morning. Uh, and then I just want to talk about some investments in people. So since uh, our difficult times in 2014, our net faculty, full-time tenure track faculty has increased by eight. That means we filled all the positions that we had at the time, it kept those solid, and then we have a net increase of eight new, new and then staff plus 55 uh, for a total, this is around uh, 452. Administrators are actually down. I take great pride in the, uh, I always tell David Flanagan every time I see him, my administrative team still costs less than his administrative team, so I take a little pride in that. Uh, so we've been trying to keep administration down, staff that support students up, and faculty that teach students up. Uh, now the other investment is around students. Uh, $16 million have gone into scholarships since 2015. That is a game changer for us. Why are we growing in enrollment? Because people can afford us. They can go semester to semester without worrying and struggling. They can go more full time. Our investment in, in students is number one. Now sometimes I get complaints from students saying, Luther Bonnie has really run down. You need to do something about the bathroom. True, so where have we <laughs> went? True, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I want to say, where are we actually putting your money? In you. Now, if I had all the money in the world, I'd fix the bathrooms and I'd give you scholarships. <laughs> but if I have to choose, we're going to have an okay bathroom. Okay, some days not even that. Uh, but you're going to get the scholarships you need to get through college, and that's, that's our first priority. The next priority is for us to have capital improvement and capital investments, and we have a plan for that. We have a number of things that we can do to improve. Also, we've been done in access to education. We know a lot of folks are coming as new Americans to us, for example, who need philanthropic help to try to get here because there are many of them, if they're in an asylum seeking situation, they're not necessarily able to get, in fact, they definitively aren't able to get Pell Grants and, and uh, loans and all the things that actually work for making college affordable. And finally, equity and social justice. Well, thanks to many students here, thanks to uh, many people on this cabinet, we are getting smarter about issues around social justice because quite frankly, we had a fairly limited view of what it meant to be truly inclusionary, truly equitable, and move towards social justice. It's messy, but it's beautiful. We're getting vulnerable, we're saying we don't have the answers, we're what we call, what we heard in the lecture last night, we are culturally humble, and that's a good thing. We don't have the answers and we don't know what we think we don't know, and we're also afraid to look at certain things. Now we're lifting up the rug on that. A little messy, it's okay because we're working towards something. We'll talk about the details of that. Uh, by the way, this is actually really good news. So when we came here in 2014, 15, 28,002 was the average for, for four years here. The average debt was just under $30,000. Today it is $23,000. Fantastic. Fantastic. What that means is your education will leave you less burdened than a used Toyota. And that's a good piece of news, right? Now, Toyotas tend to last a long time, but not as long as your, your, uh, your, uh, your college degree. Yeah, the, what are the themes are next? When I think about, we've had the 10 goals, and they will continue to guide us. But when I think about the things that we want to push for in the university, and this is really my last slide, when I think about what needs to happen is we are not pleased Anybody who thinks that we are a backup school, that's insufficient, it's inappropriate, and we're moving forward to change that reputation. And guess what? We don't actually have to do a huge amount to prove that. Because honestly, we're already that. It's now a communication gap between what people perceive and what the reality is. We're gonna be starting to work on that. That means that we're gonna start sending messages about excellence in our marketing that we have 250 tenure-track research-based faculty at this school, that we have almost 600, thanks to the work of Rebecca and her team in the honors program, we have almost 600 honors students. Our average grade point average has gone up literally from 2.8 to almost 
Those are the kind of things that we have that there's no excuse for us not holding. There's nobody should take away the mantle of excellence here. And quite frankly, when you compare us to our, our, our non-public competitors, we win on price point tremendously. So why would you pay more and literally get less? So our marketing is in the next five years is going to start with academic excellence. We're going to make equity and justice a huge piece of what we do because as I, has been pointed out to me in the last 10 or 12 months, it's not good enough to, for USM to be good about equity and social justice. We have to be excellent because people look at us. The reason I think they're tougher on us than other places is because they expect more from us about this issue. And it's important for our ability to bring people in and make them successful. It's good for our, our retention and all that stuff. But more importantly, it's the morally right thing to do. A great university has to be strong about this. And we'll talk about those details in just a bit. Superior value. As you saw, our price point is, is absolutely approachable for, for main families. And we're reducing the debt burden. Connecting students with their futures Career, our students tell us all the time, they tell me all the time, I love the excellence in the classroom, but I have to get a job when I leave. My parents are not giving me a trust fund, at least that I know of, and I'm going to have to find a job. So combine my education, and they just tell me, one of the reasons I go to USM is because you're surrounded here in Portland and in Lewiston and greater Portland, you're surrounded by job opportunities. And I, need, I come to you so that I can get those internships, co-ops, job experiences, et cetera. Finally, strong, uh, the last few, strong relationships and supportive environment. I can tell you, I have, see it every day in my inbox, that there are faculty and staff who are changing the message about students here. They're saying, I want you to succeed. What do I have to do to help you succeed? There are people who are spent spending that time on that extra email. They're being kinder about certain things with students that are helpful to students. And they're trying to figure out how we can get the resources and the support for them to succeed academically and financially here at the university and culturally here at the university. Multiple points of access across the lifespan. So we also remember that we have a lot of our students who are non-traditional. We want to strengthen that. We want to have a strong online presence for working moms and dads that have no time to get here. People who are out there in the world trying to figure out how they can get their education because they started life and they didn't finish their education. And that will be a major component of us. And then finally, we think environmental stability and sustainability is very, very big. It's a hallmark. And remember, 72% of college students say your environmental integrity and principles of the university will make a difference in where I go to school. It will be a part of my consideration. That dormitory or that residence hall that I showed you, if we do it the way we have it planned now, will be the largest passive house residence hall in American higher education. That means that the amount of energy and fossil fuel that we'll have to use to heat that place will be down significantly from traditional builds. And those kind of things we can build on and make a reputation for it. I believe Maine will be building on this. So I'm just going to stop there. Uh, if you have questions uh, other than storm days, then you just could feel free to email me. And, uh, so um, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, so now it goes to you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you have the, you know, the, uh, the opportunity and, uh, uh, to ask. There are two microphones, one here, one there. Unfortunately, nobody's going to run around, so you have to kind of get up there and ask. And I think what I'll do, in most cases, the folks behind me will probably have more detailed or drill down answers. But if I can answer them, I'll, I'll do my best. So um, I'll just leave it open to you. And if people want to grab a microphone, you can do that. So, ooh, I'm not a town hall kind of guy, so this is new to me. I don't really know where to look or where to stand. Um, I have a question for Janine. Um, my name's Nathaniel, and I'm a media studies major here at USM. And um, we've heard a lot about the production lab, and we wanted to know what you're doing with that. I think that may go to Nancy, right? Is yeah, I, actually, Nancy, Nancy and I have been consulting. Okay. Um, for the moment, nothing is happening with the Media Production Lab. It will stay where it is currently. Um, I will say that in the context of all the building that will be happening on this campus in the next two years, 
many entities will need to move. Um, one of the long-term goals we have for the, for the Portland campus is to do a, a renovation of our athletic facilities. That is, you know, that's years out on the horizon, but I think if that were to happen, um, the media production studio would have to move. Right now, the media production studio will not be moving. Um, I, I would say that the media production studio, and I think this is something for the department to think about, students, faculty, and staff, um, that studio will be in the middle of the loudest, dustiest, lengthiest focus of the construction. Um, so I think the department should consider whether it would like to request a move elsewhere, perhaps to the basement of Pace and Smith. I, I think the noise above, above you in that area might be difficult, but for the moment, that nothing will, nothing will change. Um, but I do think if the department wants to come up with alternatives for what could happen, where that studio could move, at least to just get through the, the worst of the construction. Once the new, once the new student center is built and um, entities that are going into the new student center have moved, there will be spaces, I'm sorry, that open up. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it, we, Nancy and I talked about perhaps WMPG's current space being good space for a future CMS media space. So, but for now, status quo. Nancy, so do you wanna? I will jump in and tell you this, that um, no decisions have been made and are not written in stone yet about where services and academic um, components or facilities management will go and move in relationship to the P3 project. We're having conversations with individuals, we're looking and exploring a variety of options. The Media Lab is smack dab in what will be um, kind of construction zone, the, right, the yeah. zone zero or whatever you wanna call it. So we're trying to look at what the alternatives are. It's not going away. If we remove it and replace it this summer, it will be as good if not better than what you have currently, that's our promise. We have money in the budget of the P3 project to relocate services and to relocate facilities management and renovate if needed. So we're still working through all of that. Our process is, is to look at all of the options, have conversations with people. Um, John Souther, myself, had a conversation with the faculty and with the dean just last Friday when we, had, when we were closed, we did a Zoom meeting. We understand the pain point we understand better what the move would mean. Um, so we're trying to figure out all of these pieces. That will go to the president's cabinet. The president's cabinet will, and the leadership team with the deans, will look at what our proposals are for moves, and then we will move it out. And I'm having conversations with just about everybody. And I think you can all respect that when you talk about space, just how painful it is for people. Space is a critical resource of which we are very, very short on space on the Portland campus. So they've been really um, difficult conversations and such, but we need to um, move services and such, so we're having those conversations. conversations. So basically right now, no decision's been made, and um, certainly we want what's best for that area, and we would definitely promise to have, um, if it does move, that would be something, we have not made that decision yet, um, it would certainly would be supported by the deans and above and would be something that we would be talking to that department about extensively. Yeah, um, one thing, it might be supported by the deans, but it's definitely not gonna be supported by the students. And Appreciate as that. slide 11 says, yep. student focused every day. Yeah, I absolutely. I really don't know if this decision was student focused. Thank you, I wanna thank you for Thank you for becoming a town hall person uh, overnight. Hi. Um, I'm Barbie Ives, finance manager in the College of Management and Human Services. And um, the enrollment numbers have been looking really good and trending well, and I'm wondering if you can tell us anything about what you expect next year. Sure. Um, 
Stephen, maybe I'll just look at, I always like a little background context if I'm going to talk about enrollment. So maybe you can go to slides uh, 51 and 52, which just show that background, a little bit of our trajectory. And then I'm going to tie it to more current year. So this is what President Cummings has been talking about, you know, a remarkable change since the, the tough times of 2013 and 15 and this steady, this steady enrollment growth in a lot of different channels, out of state, in state. This new category, I know we've been talking about it for a long time, but in its own category, early college. So overall, heading in the right direction. This is, uh, you can go to slide 21, actually. It's part of our enrollment and budget. It's in the budget section, Stephen, but I think it also talks a little bit about the importance of how we get this. Um, this is how, it, how, our, how our projections going forward have to line up with actual performance. And so this is something that, since I've been here with uh, working with Alec, that we put a lot of time under his leadership of trying to forecast everything at the university. But I do, this is a really important point, um, is that we've, we've sometimes had a higher aspirations for our budget growth, I mean, in credit hours, than our actuals. Not, not always. Um, but what we want to do is smooth out these lines so that the yellow lines up with the blue. The blue is what we go to the trustees and say we believe we can attract, and the yellow is where we've landed. So in the years past, the good news is our out-of-state credit hour com composition has actually overperformed. And the blue, and on the in-state, here's where we are. We all know the story, but I mean, we've had the negative growth. I mean, we have the negative demographic gravity every year. I mean, tw the 2008 birth dearth is going to hit us in 2025, 20, 24. Uh, where the whole country um, experiences a major cliff when it came to population um, and births. And so as we become more realistic with the in-state, we have to go out of state. And the real thing, and I don't know if I have that slide from last fall, Stephen, the one with the funnel. The big thing that I notice is a challenge um, is that we're, is the housing shortage. And so when we look at that, um, we look at that funnel we brought up to the, I use this, the BOV. This is about a couple months into my job, but here's where, here's where, this is the good news. If you look at our last year, the, the last year's class, we had 34% increase in out-of-state applications in one year. And a lot of that was helped by taking our application fee away, which is definitely a normal practice now. We started that years ago up at Farmington. Um, but we were also overall up 13%. And so this is all the marketing, the great reputational strength heading in the right direction, mixed with good policy changes, including the SAT optional policy that came in middle of that year. So we were up in FAFSA submissions, which is another really great signal. And we were also um, down 3% for at that point in time. It improved in the final weeks with all of our early college enrollments. But we had 14 fewer out-of-state students this, that came in this year and 40 fewer in-state students. That was made up by graduate enrollment, and that was made up by early college enrollments, which is a, an area that we need to expand. But the reason being, we didn't have housing. And so if you think about the competitive New England market that we're in, it's hard until we get this dorm. And if, we're, if we've moved our occupancy to, and I'm going to round the numbers, but to 1,100 to 1,380 um, beds over in Gorham by what I was told converting even some faculty offices into dorm rooms. And I've seen those triples and they look good. The renovations look good. But we know that we have a pain point of on a retention side because we've put students in some pretty tight quarters in some situations. And on the other hand, we're also competing further and further away from, from Maine with higher, you know, quality students who are driving by other residential campuses also competing for them. And, and they're not really interested in finding their first rental apartment at 17 or 18 years old. So it's become a reality choke point, what I call it. And I've, this is the first time I've seen this. It's kind of a good, bad problem. The demand is building, which is great. Um, but our ability to put people all the way through the yield and get them here um, is, I think, been a bad problem. So all that to say that in the next couple of years, we're really focusing on our adult, adult enrollments. Uh, getting those back on track, there's been a behavioral change in the last two years that I've been putting in front of most groups, the deans, president's cabinet, that we need to make sure that adult students are taking just as many credit hours as they were two or three years ago, and they're not right now. So that's been a little bit of a mixture change that we want to make sure we're doing, improving on, and, and then when we have more capacity on all our channels, 
I think we're going to see more traditional enrollments, more transfer enrollments, and um, options for graduate students as well with the dorm coming on online. So I hope that helps kind of yeah, like the current Yeah, when do we year. expect to see the dorm? What, what are we, you know, what are we thinking? Fall, of, fall 22. Fall 22. 22, okay. Yep. I hope I offered enough context. I can go into some other things too with other questions. Hi, I'm Jean Kerrigan from Advising. And um, this answered some of my questions, but I know, Glenn, you had said the communication about how to get people to see that USM is not a backup plan for them. Can you speak more to some specifics that you might have in mind? There's a lot of, in Maine, uh, word of mouth information that's not always accurate about the University of Maine system, about what a four-year liberal arts degree can and can't do, and that filters down to their kids. So I'd be very interested in that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question, and I'll, I'll ask some other people to weigh in on that. Maybe the provost can weigh in on that as well. So part of it is, like, how do you present yourself? And so the last five years, we've had a marketing campaign that people really intuitively loved. It's, uh, it was the University of Everyone not an academic excellence message, right? I hate to say it, but in humanity, we all like to feel a little superior to our fellow man. Mm -hmm. And so hyper-inclusiveness on academic levels is something we have to be careful of. Hyper-inclusiveness on our total embracing of all people has to be our top priority. So one of the things we're doing is looking at, are we marketing ourselves the right way? Should we also be university of everyone in an inclusive way but it, not necessarily that we just have no standards. And that's kind of the way it was coming across to people. People would sometimes say, oh, I really like it. And then they would say, yeah, but I'm, I'm not going to send my kid there, right? So what they were telling me is, I like it for other people, but not for my own kid. The standards that we're now starting to use is we should never lose in our competition on issues of excellence. Because we're able to give things through our faculty and through our staff and through our research that other people can't do. And we now need to push that excellence. So you're going to see a whole series of marketing direction uh, under the leadership of Jared and his team that you will see more push about why we're great. We're going to try to highlight faculty that have been doing great research and getting national attention. We have that here. Some of the great projects that are coming out of the Cutler Institute and the and Muskie School that are now at the national level of giving applied cultural and social and economic data that's helping people make decisions across the country. Let's start bringing that to the front and let's start highlighting that. The other thing you said is about jobs. So what's happened in, this is kind of a sad piece of demographics, but when we were pushing for the bond package a year ago, November, a pretty kind of disheartening figure, a uh, poll came out that said something like 61 to 63 percent of Mainers were suspect about getting a college degree. Now, having grown up in a working class home here in Maine, that was a pretty disheartening thing for me to hear because my parents, even though they didn't have college degrees, were really pretty clear that their, their children were going to. And now we've got people who are suspicious. Why are they suspicious? The belief that debt is too high, and we just proved that we are not, and I'm not sure they're going to get a job. And that goes to the issue of, quote, liberal arts and whatever. I want to be really clear. I think it's a false kind of conversation that liberal arts don't make you ready for the world. In fact, I would make the argument that it really makes you ready for the world. It's a good idea to have a few technical skills. Burning Glasses said, if you have a liberal arts degree and you have just three STEM-related courses, you triple your chances of getting hired. Basic coding course, an IT management course, uh, could be a, a, you know, some kind of science or biology course. So that combination is wise, but what you're learning in liberal arts are the things that really matter. And you get taught here well by our faculty. Things like how to work with other people, how to communicate, how to, how to collaborate, and how to problem solve, and how to self-manage, uh, you know, really kind of a executive function, the ability to get things done without constantly bothering your supervisor, right? Those three or four things you learn in the liberal arts so we believe there's, not, there's a, a strength. But the other thing that really helps you get a job is having an internship. And we think we're going to strengthen that message 
to Maine people. If you come here, it's almost what Northeastern has done in the Boston area. If you come here, you go there, you'll have a co-op, you'll walk out with job experience. And we believe we are, we're just at the cusp of being able to do that. And obviously faculty have to buy in, but you know, when I talk to faculty, they're like, are you kidding? I already do that. It's fantastic, of course. So I, I'm not feeling that faculty is going to resist that. So when I think about you know, how do you define yourself, this is something that we can bring to the main people. And I, I know what working class people are thinking about. They're thinking about, is my kid going to get a job? Can I afford this? And is it a quality place, what I call the iron triangle, right? And I think we can win on every piece of that iron triangle. We can win on excellence, we can win on affordability, and we can win on getting them ready for a career. So that next five years is about building strength and sending the right messages out to the world and to, to main people on those three. So I think it's if I may add a few more items there, Glenn, because this has been so much of the work since, my, since I've arrived six, seven months ago with the President's Cabinet and with a lot of the different departments uh, who have invited me around to talk about benchmarking ourselves against the market competition. We've actually, thanks to Nancy and folks before Nancy, we've done, we've done an amazing job, Rachel, but we've done an amazing job doing an accepted student questionnaire every year and to the tune of getting seven to 900 accepted students to respond Every year, uh, every other year is the best practice, actually. And they tell us the difference between what we know about our quality and how they perceive our quality. It's that perception gap. And they also, this is a, this is a study that's been done for 30 or 40 years by the college board. It's, an accept, it's a service you can buy. Um, they also compare us to how those students are perceiving us against the competitors they applied to, because we all do the same survey. And so, not my favorite thing to do is broadcast to my competitors our gaps, so I didn't bring those, those breakdowns on how we stack up against UNE and UNH and Husson, but we have them. And I'd love to come to your department meetings and show you some of those realities. They're not true realities, but the perception of those realities are, are real. So we've been taking a really hard, what I call a hard look at ourselves in the mirror on, as far as those perceptions. And that's really what we're trying to address with our next coming campaign. You know, the umbrella of that campaign is often what we see on TV and in our digital ads, but we do a lot of segmented messaging based off different programs. I really want to thank Trace, who's here in the audience, and her team that does an amazing job at looking all that and leading brand, and brand strategy here at the university. But we had a really aggressive six months really bringing it to the leadership table and talking about this and making sure that it aligns with our, our which fortunately it does, it aligns so well with our goals uh, and our academic vision and all the things that are coming together with this branding uh, plan. So one other thing I just wanted to show as evidence and its momentum, uh, a couple things. This is an, I wanna, I'll take a, the floor anytime to share this, 59, uh, Stephen. This is a slide, I appreciate John Barker, and who's in the room. Uh, it's, a, it's a way that I've often looked at shaping a class. Um, so I asked him if he could break this report, and it, it is a bit traditional focused, I will admit to that, so it's only one indicator. But this is what's happened in the last few years on academic quality coming into the camp, uh, coming into USM. So this is, what you do is you take your incoming high school GPAs and the way that we evaluate them in admissions, and you break down all of them over five year period into individual quartiles. So top, bottom, in between. And then you break each respective incoming cohort into those quartiles so that you can see relative to the years, how are we shaping academically? Places I've been make it a goal, and they've been good institutions, they make it a goal to shape, shape these 5% or so from the tail to the top. This is remarkable transformation when you look at the gray bottom quartile of 322 students relative to these five years, would have been there five years ago to 216. What happened in 2019 that we don't often talk about, and if I have any Orono friends watching, I'm sorry, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of competition this last year that went out for top students, and I was part of the recipient of that at Farmington as well. I called Nancy and talked about it. We are, one of our problems, and you'll hear the trustees talk a lot about it, is we are, we are still very much competing with one another. In middle of the year last year, there was a major campaign in Maine um, to come back and go after students with a 3.1 GPA or better with a free tuition move. And so we, I believe USM felt that a little bit on that upper quartile, and those are hard things, and those will be new realities with the changes that the Department of Justice has made in the country for people to compete later for students, to go after students late in the process and repackage more competitively. But this is tremendous, um, this is tremendous 
upswing, and it's what's it's showing the merits working. It's showing your student focused uh, mission has been resonating. It's just now we need for the next five years to bring it to the next level. And this is my last slide, and we've got others, but it's a high level slide on 48, Stephen. If you take all of those studies I was referring to, accepted student questionnaire over the years, and you, and you take the 90 pages, okay, that slice and dice everything from the way our curb appeal looked to everything, and you, and you take the summary of all of our competitors that competed against us, and you say, what were our strengths versus theirs on perception? We've always won on cost of attendance. Who is this right now? This is UMaine, always is our top overlap school, UNH. I'm sorry, UNE, next. Then UNH, Husson, and Farmington. Those are our top five overlap schools. But where we've been struggling a bit to tally past our com competition is academic reputation. The one that I'm really uh, excited about changing is, because I think it's right in front of us, is internship opportunities. It's a huge deal that you expanded our, we expanded our internship opportunities across every academic program. So we know that's not the reality, but it's the perception perhaps that we have to make that more clear. So these are the type of things we're looking at, availability of majors, we're close. It depends on who we're lined up against on a lot of these things, and we tease it out by different competitors. And I will tell you, we, we go right past certain competitors in certain ways, but we also trail other competitors uh, in other factors. And where we really want to win is value for price, academic reputation with the academic excellence message, and you know that career connectedness uh, through uh, internships. We hope we can kind of move that needle up, especially since that's a lot what Gen Z is looking for. There are other slides that get into this type of data, but I will just say that I'm more than willing to be invited around and give the whole presentation because I don't want to dominate the time. Hi, my, my name is Janice Albright, and I'm also one of the advisors in the Portland campus. And um, our advising staff has the wonderful opportunity to work with the new students coming in. And we have a, the hour and a half conversations um, that are combined with efforts throughout the university. And we also um, are um, thinking of ways of always improving. So we have a lot of staff meetings about that. And one of the things um, that occurred to me is I think that the students get a really nice welcome letter from admissions. And then we do a lot of welcoming and hopefully help ground them. And I was wondering if there maybe could be sort of another layer with um, a strategic uh, the sort of points that the departments could um, reach out to them. And I know that a lot of the departments are away for the summer, but perhaps there could be some scheduled open houses across campus or even a template of a, of a letter that goes out from the departments. And I know that some of the departments are always doing that, but I think it's a little bit haphazard. And I think if we kind of work together, um, in sort of coming up with a plan. I know the students, once we finish with them, they are so eager to meet their faculty and to connect with the departments. And sometimes, just due to circumstances, um, people are on vacation or you know not here. And it's a little bit of a letdown sometimes for these students. And I wanna keep them up and keep them excited. So I'm just throwing that out and um, more than happy to to work with other people who might think that's a good idea. Thank you, Janice. Um, I would say that the deans are all here and they're listening and we will put this on one of our, um, one of our dean's agendas. I'd also say that um, Beth Higgins is here, whom you may know, um, and uh, Beth led the institution last year in um, basically a year-long university-wide assessment of advising practice that included professional staff advising and faculty advising. And, and uh, essentially that study identified, of course, places where we are doing really well, but you know, uh, the purpose of that study is to really identify the gaps. And the, I would say the primary gap that we discovered in that year of study was the transition from professional advising under 54 credits to faculty advising, and moving from that um, 
professional staff advising office culture where you walk in every you can walk in any time and you know there's always someone in the office to a faculty culture advising that can actually that can just be a culture shock for students and they're not always prepared for it um, that might be slightly different from what you're talking about but I do think there are departments that are absolutely models for how this works and um, we can figure out who those model departments are. I won't name them here, um, but, but I think I know who many of them are, and we could develop recommendations for other departments that would like to do more of that kind of welcoming. And you know, the, a pizza party, an ice cream social, those things are not expensive, and they really go a long way. Um, so thank you. Maybe it's because the mic is still, you know, right next to me. I, I, I don't want to compete with anyone, but um, I do have another question. So I'm wondering, from your standpoint, how you think things are going with AP, by which I mean Academic Partners, the online teaching platform that we've been piloting. How blunt shall I be? Um, I, I think that AP has been disappointing. Um, the enrollments aren't where we thought they would be at this point. Um, I and I and Jared and Alec and Glenn and also Paul Cochran, who's the director of CTEL, um, are in frequent conversations to figure out what we should do to respond to that. Um, my instinct looking at what's happening nationwide is that we may have kind of missed the bubble, you know, and we might have entered that nationwide market a little too or a little too late. You know, we're seeing we're seeing enrollments nationwide drop off a little, or even out in the online, um, in the national online marketplace. Um, unless you're the big players, unless you're SNHU or Western Governors, I think. The enrollment spikes that we were seeing five years ago are just, they might not be realistic anymore. Um, so what, what happens with AP if we, if we do more with AP or less with AP is yet to be determined, but it is an open question, at least in my mind. Um, I would say that right now, from an academic affairs perspective, an enrollment perspective, our answer to AP is to build it in-house. Because what AP taught us um, was how to really uh, respond to the needs of adult learners, to have six starts a year and not go semester by semester. Adult, adults who are working don't want spring and fall. They want six starts a year. When they decide they want to start a degree, they want to start it tomorrow. Um, and so we got, we got what I knew we would get from AP, which is professional development, around how you deliver the kinds of programs that can compete with Hassan and St. Joe's, but can be our academic quality. Um, because one thing I know about our programs, and this goes to the point about academic quality that we've been talking about, um, USM's faculty are research active. They have the top degrees from the top institutions. Um, we can compete on faculty quality with, with Bowdoin, with UVM, with UMaine, we can compete. Um, we can, we can out-compete all of those schools on price. What we haven't been able to do is take our high-quality, affordable education and provide access. And so AP demonstrated this is how you bring access to the equation. So right now, Paul Cochran is um, working to build what will essentially be an in-house version of AP. So uh, a targeted set of programs, primarily at the master's level. Cybersecurity will be one, leadership will be one, uh, the MSW already is one, um, the MFA has been one since the 80s when it was a correspondence course, and we're putting together a portfolio of AP-style programs that we will, con we will con control the market, we'll control the messaging around those, we will do the marketing, and we'll keep all the tuition. <laughs> um, and then eventually when the AP contract ends, which it will at some point, if not sooner than expected, we will be ready as an institution to catch those AP programs and keep all the tuition. Well, the contract that the system signed was a 10-year contract. 
it's a, but it's a system contract. It's not a USM contract. So we were a party to it. Um, you know, 10 years is actually quite short. You know, in, 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 the, in the, you know, scope of higher ed, 10 years goes by pretty quickly. Um, so, so we will get those programs back at some point. Um, but I will just say, you know, we have to acknowledge that enrollment's been disappointing in those programs. I don't know if anyone else cares to talk about AP. Academic partnerships, these are the programs. Um, there are six programs uh, that, through which we have partnered with Academic Partnerships, which is an online learning management provider, kind of like a Pearson's. Um, AP, Academic Partnerships, works only with public institutions of higher education. Um, so, so there is a, a, you know, a partner to us in providing the infrastructure for these degrees, even though the faculty and the programs are ours. So sorry for not explaining that. It's, it's on my plate every day. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you all for answering these questions for us. Uh, my name is Eric Isley. I'm a student in the Muskie School of Public Policy, and I'm also a graduate from the Media Studies and Political Science programs here at USM. Um, you've talked a lot about perception, reputation, recruitment, and retention. Um, the demographics of the greater Portland area where we draw many of our students from is changing, has changed, our student body has changed. Um, USM has recently been in the news um, for its own um, issues dealing in race and equity. Um, and uh, Glenn, you've brought that up. Can you talk a little bit about what we are doing as an institution to support our black, indigenous, and students of color? So I think, um, I think a number of us at the table have responses to this. Um, this is the question that's most on my mind and I've been um, enjoying a long email thread um, in the past, oh, the past 24 hours um, about what it would really look like for USM to be an anti-racist institution. And you know, there's no question that we want to be an anti-racist institution. I think, I think I've been clear about saying that that's my goal for the institution. How we get there, and, and the email thread has been all about the how. how. How would we do this? How do we get there? What do we do? Um, and Eric's right, if you look at the, at the uh, demographics on the 2019 incoming class, and this is full-time students only, um, we are, that class is 22% non-white by their own reporting, um, which probably means the class is closer to 25, 26% by federal definitions, non-white slash minority. And this is, um, this is a huge change from where USM was 10 years ago. So, so the change has been quick and um, it's resulted in incredible diversity on this campus that was, was before this unknown to USM. So I can respond to what I know we're doing. Um, it is not enough. And this will be the project of all the decades that I can foresee ahead of me and my career, for sure. This work will never be done. And I think that's why the how can be so challenging because I don't think we will ever feel like we're doing enough. I really see this as a slow and steady wins the race kind of, um, kind of, plan um, where no one will ever win, we'll just get better and better over time. So the things that we're doing um, right now include the common read, which you know, you've seen plenty of information about the common read. Um, oh yeah, so Stephen, this is, you're, you're ahead of me. Um, the common read, um, this semester, uh, people are leading pop-up courses on the common read, how to be an anti-racist. They are leading discussion groups. Student faculty and staff are leading discussion groups at various times and places around campus and you will get invitations to those and there will be a Google sign-up form so you can avail yourself of those opportunities. Um, we will have, a, there is a slate of, of common read speakers already, which culminates with the author of that book, um, Dr. Kendi, 
being both our commencement speaker and host, uh, holding a, a keynote presentation on May 9th in the evening that will be free and open to the public. So there's a speaker series to go along with the Common Read. If you're interested in knowing more about that, just visit the Common Read website. It is usm.maine.edu slash read. So there's more information. I won't, I won't say anything more about that. USM is partnering, partnering with the Racial Equity Institute to offer REI trainings. These are two-day trainings um, on campus. And there are uh, trainings available in uh, this month and also in March with spaces still available. Um, I have built equity and inclusion of modules into both our new faculty orientation and the chair development series. Um, I think the department chairs were uh, surprised this year in chair development to have uh, a panel on microaggressions or everyday racism, as well as um, a two-hour workshop with Vaishali Mamgain on compassion. And you know that was a new experience for academic leadership at the institution to spend two hours doing compassion building with one another. Um, the, other, the last thing I would say is that um, one really important thing the students are asking for is that the faculty body come to represent more closely the makeup of the, fa of the student body. Um, and this is an absolutely reasonable request and we are trying. And um, my expectation and hope is that we will make some really good progress with the searches we have open right now faculty and staff searches. Um, the reason I'm confident that we will make good progress there is because this year, for every faculty and staff position we had open, we required every member of every search committee to go through a two-hour strategizing the search training that Natalie Jones and I co-led. Um, and uh, Megan Schratz, also uh, our HR partner, did some of those trainings. And these were not biased trainings, per se, but they did include instruction in implicit bias, um, in cultural bias, in, in those kinds of racisms and sexisms and, and other kinds of biases that are just in our culture, because they are. Um, and they are invisible until you take off the, the blinders and you see them. And so that training was, was um, in part about allowing people to see bias, and it was also really about strategizing with search committees how to write ads and invite people to campus so that we could create the most diverse pools of applicants possible in every field. And you know, a diverse pool in engineering looks very different from a diverse pool in nursing, but this is the level of detail that we were working with. And I'll just repeat, because I think it's important, that those trainings were mandatory for faculty and staff if they wanted to serve on one of those search committees. A diversity statement was also mandatory for anyone who was applying here for a tenure track job. So if you want to come here and teach USM students as a tenure track faculty member, you had to be able to express in your own words in a diversity statement what diversity, equity, and inclusion meant to you and what your experience was with, um, with, with working in it and with it um, and then I think I will turn it over to David. You probably want to say something about the um, Intercultural Student Affairs Center. Sure. Uh, I didn't know if we were going to hit the AVP position as well, but. Oh, sure. You want to do that? To? You want to yeah. do that yeah. first? Uh, so we are searching for uh, an AVP, Associate Vice President for Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. Um, this will be a position that reports to the president, but has an office in the provost suite. So kind of uh, getting the most access we can for both halves of the institution. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. And that is rolling out when, Natalie? It takes three seconds. Well, a lot of things take three seconds. Um, so that posted yesterday. So for those of you who have not seen it, the Associate Vice President for Equity and Inclusion and Community Impact um, is uh, up on the Higher Touch site, so it's on our website. We're kicking off our next level of the marketing campaign next week. I can't say enough about the subcommittee of IDAC who has worked on this tirelessly. Um, Suhair and Tracy and Rusty and 
uh, the like. Um, we have we did a call out for um, to see if anyone would be interested in serving on this search committee. Um, I would like to say if I could have that kind of response every time I ask people if they want to search on the serve on the search committee, I would be the happiest VP of HR uh, in the world. We have students, um, um, and we will be paying them to serve on that search committee. Uh, we have faculty, we have staff. Um, I'm really um, incredibly impressed um, with how uh, engaged people are. So we spent months. Uh, we started this work last spring. Uh, reimagining what this role is going to look like, um, bringing it back to IDAC, getting adjusted, bringing it back to IDAC, getting adjusted again. <laughs> and I think that we have a really solid um, uh, scope of work out there. We also did the work, it was really uh, enlightening for me to do the work that I ask people to do every day and that we teach every day, which is really walking through a job description and stripping out the barriers, saying, uh, no, I'm sorry, um, no offense to risk management, no, I'm sorry, risk management, this person doesn't have to drive, right? That's not part of the job. I need to know if they can travel, but they don't need to drive. Um, what other barriers are we including in our job descriptions that would uninvite people to apply for positions? The BOV has had to heard, hear my speech on this, so I won't go through the whole thing again. But being engaged in that work, getting the push and pull from students in that process as well, was wildly important and will inform this work on every single search going forward to improve it. So I can't, I can't thank this group enough. So that is up. It will be up for 30 days because it has to be up for 30 days in order to do a sponsorship. Um, so some people are like, oh, we need to get this turned around. And I say, well, we need a really great pool. So um, I'll, I'll abbreviate myself now. I'm happy to talk to anyone after or if there are follow-up questions, but I want to make sure that David has a chance to talk about what's happening in the ISE too. Even probably knows where I'm going. Um, but before I speak to ISE, I just want to do like a public announcement that uh, if you haven't heard, uh, Dean Rodney Mondor is coming back next week. So I, I want to let you all know. We share that excitement, but I think when we, when we have so many uh, here, I want to get that news out, and I know we all extend well wishes, and we'll be happy to see Rodney back. Uh, just briefly, because I see we have some people at the microphones, um, we have two things happening. ISE, we've had a gap all year in intercultural student engagement. Uh, we, our search was not successful in the fall, so we kind of had to reboot. Uh, we heard a lot from our students, and one of the reasons that uh, we took a lot of feedback from our students that were involved in the process, so we didn't move forward with a hire in the fall, which, is, which has, you know, I want to acknowledge, we've had a gap in this area all year. We're trying to fill that gap with uh, a, a, a process this semester that is almost finalized. And again, we're, we were waiting for students to get back to review all the materials. We had a, a call out and we had 30 plus um, applicants uh, for just a, a positions this spring that we want to uh, bring on to, uh, to help our students, uh, to connect with our students, to do programming. So we're, we're, we're almost there with that, which I know the president will be happy to hear because he, he asks me frequently. Um, but we are uh, working closely with our, our students and advisory group uh, from the diversity centers. And then um, uh, my plan, and uh, Natalie just shared, um, it was very important for me that the, the vice president position go out and then we put the director position out. So we're going through a similar process that Nat Natalie just outlined. And uh, Stephen, for the last slide, you, you might see our timeline. Uh, you'll, you know, the campus community, particularly, uh, again, um, students that we are engaged in will be significantly involved in our process over the next few weeks to get our materials out into the, into the public, uh, the posting, so we can do, uh, make sure that we have our process uh, that involves students in the search for our new director uh, in April uh, with a, hopefully a hire that would start in the next, uh, over the summer uh, for the next academic year. And I'm happy to take questions after, but I'd love to get to these individuals at the microphone. Before we do that, can I uh, respond to the, I just want to take a second to talk about equity and inclusion and why this is fundamental to the university. And first of all, I just want to take a moment 
to say thank you to the many students and staff and faculty who have really helped us go deeper in our understanding about these issues. Thank you to all of them. When all of our professors were told that they had to take an implicit bias training before they could be on a search committee, not all of them appreciated that. I have to say it's consistent with national data. We doctorate prepared somewhat overly confident intellectuals believe that we're too smart to have biases. We believe that. In fact, the, the Harvard study showed there were two professions, lawyers, no surprise, and academic, PhD prepared, doctoral prepared schools had trouble with issues of really understanding. And this is a big, so you saw that list. If you can go back, Stephen, to that list of things that we are doing, it's significant. By the way, I just want to emphasize, in the next 90 days between now and Kendi, we have three national, international level experts on equity and inclusion coming to speak to us. Kendi, Carla Harris is one of the first major presidents of Morgan, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, as an African-American woman and her leadership and her book writing. And we have Robin DeAngelis, who is the, really the author that began to get us to look inside. And I want Bettina to just mention, Love. What's that? There's one more, Bettina Love. Oh, that's yeah. right. So, so we have four major nationals. So, so as a result, I just want to say, though, focusing on Robin uh, DeAngelis' book, White Fragility, this is tough work that goes beyond this list. Because so many of us, so we talk about humility, and we all want to be perceived as humble, but we don't actually want to act that way because it's very vulnerable. And it is very difficult work because many of us are holding parts of our brain that we don't even see that we're not asking the deeper questions, like who's not at the table at all. We just say, oh, we've got to work to have these people at the table but then you're not asking those deeper questions. What kind of messages are we sending? How do we as white people, and by the way, white was a formulation to get certain groups to have superiority and extra privilege. How do we white people combine and co-sign on our own desire to maintain our secret little privileges? This is tough intellectual work. And quite frankly, I would never have embarked on it and without taking as many punches as I've taken in the last five years. And that's sometimes what you have to do. You have to go like, why are these people angry? Like, I work for President Obama, I'm perfect. But that doesn't, that belies this inner mentality that we have that doesn't see things because it's not to our advantage to see things. What we've now done at the university as we've opened up the book on this inside ourselves, not just outside in the checklist, as we've opened up the, uh, the book on ourselves, we now have to be humble, and we have to commit to a few actions. And that action begins with, how will I look at myself? What stuff am I expected to co-sign on that I don't want to co-sign on any longer? That's a tough assignment. And it's not as pleasant and as simple as saying, look at all the great things we're doing. It is a personal transformation. We're on the journey together. We hopefully will be productive in calling each other out on this stuff. That doesn't mean always having to be civil. That means productive in calling each other out on this stuff, right? So I just want to say there's, a, there's an outward journey. We've got the checklist. We're doing the stuff. And then there's an inward journey where it really changes. And our, our hope is that we don't have to do it alone. We can do it as a fellowship of a university together. Hard work, most important work I believe you'll ever do in your life. Because if there's one thing I think we're supposed to do in this world, learn how to love a little bit better. And if we're not loving people unconsciously, we've got to own it, we've got to figure it out, we've got to work together. To that's, the, that's the world we're facing. And uh, like I say, this is not a public relations campaign. This is about the real hard work of learning how to love. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Nancy from Student Financial Services. And Glenn, you mentioned at the beginning of your statements access to education. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your plans for the Access to Education Fund at USM. Uh, 
Oh, three seconds. Yeah, that's a great question, Nancy. So for those of you who don't know, we, we are talking about access to education in a writ large type of way, but then also academic access to education is a specific scholarship fund uh, that we launched, I think last year, um, to particularly focus on students who aren't eligible for federal or state aid, many of whom are in the process of applying for seeking asylum. And so we've had a number of uh, philanthropists be very interested in investing in this, but we could always use about 100 times more funding in this scholarship than what we have. So some of the exciting news, uh, President Cummings mentioned that uh, last year we raised a record $7.3 million uh, for, for uh, USM students and for academic programs. The vast majority of that goes towards scholarships. It also, um, tease us up, which actually, Stephen, if you wanted to just move to uh, slide 30 and 31. Um, over the next year, we're going to be in the sort of quiet phase of the largest fundraising campaign in USM's history, which will be a five-year campaign, and a huge portion of that will be about scholarships. And so within that, we'll be looking at how we build the Access to Education Scholarship and how we build scholarships for students, uh, for our most for students based on need and also based on talent. Oh, and I will put in, I'll put in a quick plug and then turn it over to Nancy that um, one of the questions that we often get is, what do you raise money for? And so the USM Foundation uh, just released its annual report today that all of you can get a copy of on your way out or you can download from uh, usm.maine.edu slash foundation if you want more information. So Nancy, I just want to say thank you for asking that question. You know, this is near and dear to my heart. And the Access to Education Fund was started three years ago, and we formed it. And it's for any student that does not qualify for federal aid or state aid. So many of our students, what we don't realize is many of our students as transfer students have used up their eligibility, and they need additional resources in order to complete their degree. So it's not, it's for everybody who does not qualify. So the asylum seekers, those that have run out of aid, we've given it to veterans who have run out of benefits and, and aid over the years. It is the one fund that goes the quickest on our campus. We just don't have enough money to help all the students who have demonstrated need. So I'll just give a plug. When I give to the foundation, I give to that scholarship. So I, that's my personal plug, sorry. Hi, I'm Eric Layton from Residential Life, and I wanted to follow up. I know we've got two positions that we're hiring for um, in that area of equity, inclusion, social justice. Is there thought to having any support staff for those roles, whereas they are a VP and a director role, um, to kind of handle more of the day-to-day -day in and out, implementing a lot of the changes that we're looking to make since it is such a large amount of work? So there, yes, thank you, that's a great question. There is um, a support staff member already in place for the Associate Vice President for Equity, Inclusion, Community Impact, I think I heard. Um, so yes, there is there's support in place. There is also a faculty fellow role through IDAC that is intended to be in part a team member um, for the AVP and there is programming, there's operating budget for that position. And I'll let David speak to the student affairs position. Uh, in student affairs, we have um, admin support for the positions in the diversity center we have in the past and we will continue moving forward. What we've built in the last few years is to put more resources into the, to the operating budget um, so we can do programming, travel, um, things uh, you know, to support and enhance uh, our funding in that area. Hi, uh, I'm Dennis Gilbert. I teach for the Media Studies program, and I'd like to ask for uh, one clarification and then maybe make a couple of comments. The clarification is that I think I heard Janine say regard, with regard to the production center that no move is planned. And I think I heard Nancy say if a move does happen, et cetera. So could you guys clarify Sure. So USM has a, a new committee um, called the Space Committee. It, it did not exist two years ago, but because of all the construction and, uh, and the moves that we've made, 
in the recent years, we decided we had to have a committee that would be uh, the place where people could come and, and d essentially debate when there were disagreements about what space, how space should be used. So um, I've only been involved in this conversation for a couple of days, so I might not have all the background, but my understanding is that there is, there's been no decision made about anything changing for the Khan Media Studies space. If someone were to propose a change, that change would go to the space committee and anyone who cared to come and address the space committee in favor of either position would be welcome and the space committee is a deliberative body that votes. So, and I sit on the space committee and Nancy sits on the space committee as do a variety of other uh, people. Karen Pyers is on the space committee. Uh, Lydia Savage is the faculty representative on the space committee. Um, so so there's, a, a, there's a deliberative body should a disagreement arise, but right now nothing is planned for change with, res with respect to the CMS lab. Nancy, is that? That, that is correct, yeah. but you are, your question is, um, I appreciate it for clarification. Um, and the reality is, is we're looking at, as we talked, we're, explo we're exploring every option that's out there. So I can't sit here and say yes or no. It does go through a process. It will go through the process. Um, we've heard loud and clear that people do not want us um, to touch that area as we relocate people. Um, that's become very clear in the last week um, uh, to 10 days. Uh, we saw it as viable. I, I do think down the road, you will have to be prepared to relocate and move because I do think Janine mentioned it, that Sullivan will be going under a transformation, we certainly hope, and that will certainly impact that area. We were looking at that as a viable area for facilities to move into, um, and no decision has been made to date, but we hear loud and clear that people don't want us to touch that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I guess I would, uh, um, add to that that the media studies program is uh, the perfect poster child for the current enrollment increases. It's almost mirroring it exactly. It's one of the few in our college that's really uh, taking on uh, a new robust life. And, um, and I would also observe that my department has been moved three times in maybe the last 10 years. Not one of those moves has been on schedule. They've all been difficult. They've all pushed us to the very, we had two weeks to prepare for the fall semester the last time we moved. Um, uh, I guess I would also like to add that a space is not a place. It takes a long time to build character into a space. And the Media Studies Production Center isn't just a classroom, it's a, it's a community, it's a clubhouse, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a true learning community. And in fact, if you'd like to showcase education at work, if you do have to move it down the road, you ought to put it in the front and center of the student center where everybody can see it. Yeah, I mean, CMS is a academic excellence, real world experience embedded. That's the program, that's what you do. So I, he I hear you, Dennis, I appreciate that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think that wraps us, wraps us up. I just want to say uh, thank you. We have one thing left, so if you have your little raffle tickets, uh, we have, we're going we're gonna to draw a, uh, I think, a, a draw a raffle. So uh, hang in there, and we'll see <laughs> who wins. OK. If you had, like President Cummings said, if you have your raffle ticket, the Take USM Foundation is excited to raffle off the a, a husky snuggle pack for Valentine's Day. So, oh, I know, highly desirable. So there's a, a husky blanket built for two and a, a couple of USM mugs. All right, the lucky winner is last three numbers, one, two, zero. Yeah, Yay. big DJ. <laughs> Congratulations. And then we have two other quick items. The next item is um, made by USM alumna, Elena Marie, an Elena Marie bait bag in husky blue. And the lucky winner is 
last three numbers, 059. Yay! Yeah, actually, you have a choice between a bait bag or a baseball cap. Your call. All right, so the, the bait bag is still up for grabs. Final raffle. And on your way out, please, uh, please um, pick up a diversity main calendar from the president's office, a foundation uh, annual report if you want one, and there's some chocolate on the way out too. Um, last three numbers, 064. <gasps> Okay, going once, going twice. All right. Really sweating this one out. Okay. How about one zero zero? Yay! Here we go, and that's the raffle. Okay. So you're not going to be on the Thailand call? Yeah. Right. So the I ISC, we okay with the ISC? What's your timeline for getting this? Yeah. Come on, this came with. Sorry, sorry. It's a big day. You're not cold, Ezra. You're not cold. You're not 